Uh, good day to all of you. Uh, good, good morning, evening, and uh, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to um, to have you all there. Um, I've seen uh, over, I think, over sixty people and uh, watching at the moment. It's quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, so I'm even more happy to to go uh, go on the journey with you to to go for go through the processes to learn to learn some tips to uh, to talk a bit about creating a um, product in fact a product that allows the personalization because it is not easy task if you think about this because how would you recommend a personalized product to the thousands of customers online uh, hitting hitting your uh, website all the time from something as abstract as data, finishing with the real-time serving. My name is Hubert Pomorski, and I'm from Virtuslab. I have about a five years and a bit more of the experience in software development. Um, I'm uh, with Virtuslab for uh, two years. Uh, I started uh, directly in the, in the in the role of the of the uh, ML engineer or big data big data developer because these two are like inter interconnected with each other um, uh, for for the client I am supporting, which is a good company in the United Kingdom. Uh, what are we doing for uh, for our client? Uh, huge, in fact, amount of completely different things from processing data itself, finishing on serving the uh, machine learning models. Uh, in more free time, I'm uh, generally working with uh, uh, pen and paper RPGs when I have time, certainly not, not too much of, the, of that for me, but uh, uh, I'm also playing some board games uh, with, uh, with friends, also with fandom. Um, as I mentioned, I am coming from Virtus Lab. Virtus Lab is specializing in the in the uh, Scala. Uh, Virtus Lab has grown in Scala. However, we are way more than that right now. We are going into all the directions that we can support our clients with. Uh, it's why I'm a bit a little bit of the black sheep here, I would say, uh, because uh, I'm working with Python and the Virtus Lab have seen the opportunity to work with Python and to, and we've seen that supporting our clients with Python is, is important. And we've grown a lot from, from the beginning. We started small and now we have strong, strong team and um, we are supporting not only in the area of the personalization and uh, recommendations, we are going way, way further than, uh, than that in the world of Python. But enough of this, uh, enough of talking about me, enough about, about the Virtus Lab. Let us talk a little bit about the topic. So what are we understanding as the recommendation? Let us set up the context. So, in fact, a lot of the businesses is re uh, using recommendations right now because the we have a huge amount of data lying connected with the users uh, that we can use to recommend to to ask users to select the products that we want them to select. In fact, I there are several goals. The simplest one is uh, um, increasing the revenue because we are recommending the products that people may want to buy. It is one of the obvious use cases. The other also kind of obvious use case, but not that obvious, is the retention. The, and it is mostly connected with the, with, uh, the, with the example of Netflix uh, I am showing. Because the Netflix is um, not only recommending you the best thing that you can watch, that is like um, cut to your hand. It is also trying to understand what what you would like to watch to increase the amount, the the length of your subscription. They want you to return to the to the to Netflix because your journey 
which is quite which is quite important term for the for the, the development of the product here your journey needs to be as smooth as possible in order to make your return um, on the right you can you have also quite simple simple case so basing on the history of all the people buying things you can see what is usually what next so we for our client, we are mostly focusing on increasing the revenue. It is it is the direction that we are we are starting with. However, we recognized uh, how much value does uh, um, going with journey, enhancing the journey, bring. And recommendations in that way are recommendation and personalization. These two terms are pretty interconnected, are a pretty strong tool. Because if you can influence your user by recommending them what you see the best for them, uh, it makes it makes it easier, both for us, so for, for the provider. Um, because we can we can be ready for the things that we are recommending. For example, we can recommend the products that we are abundant of. And second, the, on the second hand, our customer is also happier because, for example, vegetarian won't be recommended meat. So it was. Um, Virtus Lab uh, was asked to support the uh, client in the providing the recommendations. So we started to analyze what do we need to provide such recommendations and what is required to provide them like end to end. So from data to serve. So we started with uh, simple things. We discovered that we must discuss so-called feature generation. So we, we must convert the data from the raw form to the form that we can use for uh, for real trainings. The second point is that we need to track them as well, because the data is strange animal, I would say, because you um, if you leave the data completely alone and you just build the solution and you do not track at all, you just find out that your the features drifted away from their pre previous meaning. And continuous analysis of that is also pretty important. Second thing is completely automated model training. So we need to automate whole pipeline. So from the features which are generated automatically, based on some definitions, we need to feed them to the train model trainings. And Mm -hmm. we need to add to the, uh, we need to build those models on pretty current data. It is quite obvious, but on the other hand, it is a challenge because we have the, um, there are many things that can go wrong in completely automated environment. And we needed to deal with them to ensure that our, the end user would receive the, the model that we would like uh, would like them to receive. Uh, we are working mostly uh, as as ML engineers. We are working mostly with data scientists, and working with data science is great if you think about building the prototypes. However, building the production ready solutions is a bit different. So, big chunk of our work was thinking how to product, how to put their work and how to not force the data science team to take new approaches how to almost seamlessly introduce their work to our product to, to the production code and as you can imagine the data science team would work with the jupyter notebooks with zeppelins uh, they would like to go through data experiment a bit and we as engineers do not like this experimentation too much we want we want stability we want the reproducibility it and the golden point where the where production starts and the experiments finish is pretty fluid and it was discovering this border was one of our goals. Uh, 
Yet another thing that we were asked for was optimization of the model training and prediction time. And it has to, uh, this, this problem has two axes. First axis is like default, uh, default understanding of this concept. So we need to optimize how long models train. And it seems obvious. We don't want to models to train too long um, time-wise. If we can speed up something, optimize something, it's cool. But there's also second part connected with the previous one. So we need to optimize time to market. So we need to optimize how many models from this uh, part of the exploration can be introduced to the end client and how quickly. Um, and the last one is we need to not only do all work on our home territory, I would say. So the Hadoop, the cluster, the over 300 nodes that are processing thousands, thousands of gigabytes of data. We need to create the models and create the infrastructure in such a way that small model, that models would take small amount of time to serve because the users do not like long wait on the on the web page so in fact we were asked to join a bit towards the world of the cloud and the world of the hadoop because in the world of hadoop where mostly data science would live we have this whole the all the data that you can you can hope for and you can work with in the world, the world of cloud, you have as many computers to serve your data as uh, and to serve your service as you would like, and uh, you can uh, minimize the lat latency, etc. But you do not have this access to data uh, be, because the, it is not the, it is not cheap, it is especially so if you have the already have the computing cluster. So we as ML engineers, somewhere between this Hadoop world and cloud world, needed to support the Hadoop solutions, uh, extract them and mend them in order to create good to, uh, to create the solutions in cloud that we can serve uh, easily and quickly. The next slide is a bit of the te technical need. It is high level overview of where the border and how we approach some problems. I would not focus too much on that, but I want to describe you at least a bit how, how, we, work, how we are working. So the journey for all the data, in, in, a, in, in fact, uh, starts in the storage. So we are using Hive for, for storing things. We have multiple feature generations that are um, producing uh, uh, at least tens or more features that are completely different between significantly different from each other. We are using feature store to save them all. Then we can uh, model train, uh, do the model training, but in the same time, we need to pass these jobs to the uh, Amazon Web Services, which, uh, which is, by the way, our host at the moment. So if we train the model, we need to do the steps that are typical ML, ML, uh, ML engineering slash data science steps. We need to set up train test set, train the model, evaluate and predict, save to the model repo. It is quite normal, normal uh, step. Then we need to export this model as well, um, which is also cool quite simple process, but working between two systems, so go, going through this dotted line may be way harder than you can imagine. Um, and on the web services side, we need to read the, read the features and treat the model. So features are landing in some DB. Model is landing within a model repository, or multiple models are landing in multiple model repositories, in, in single model repository, excuse me. And so then we need load to load them, and um, then using TensorFlow serving, on which I would focus later on, uh, 
we are serving the uh, serving it to the client endpoint and other apis are using are using our models in real time it seems quite kind of complex it is it is in fact there are multiple systems that are in play here and how to manage the complexity it is in fact the real real challenge on which I would like to discuss a bit more during during this presentation. Let us go to the um, Hadoop, Hadoop world. Inside of the Hadoop world, in fact, we are doing five major things. We must pull the data from the out, uh, from outside world. It is ingest. We need to pre-process this data in order to treat the random files from internet which we ingested as a data. So as the thing that is somehow standardized due to our um, our format, then we need to generate multiple features from the data we ingested or already was inside of the cluster. Then we you know, we are using the model trainings to um, in order to train models. In fact, so I will stop here as for a moment. Um, as you can imagine, sing single model is using multiple features. So multiple models are using obviously multiple features that are like interconnecting with each other. Saving this metadata, what model is using what features is, pre is pr pretty important because it builds the kind of the contract uh, between the models and the features. And it is the things that is thing that we are uh, we are still trying to resolve completely correctly. We are in pretty good spot right now, but uh, uh, it is the thing that is very important. And the last step in our journey is uh, from the HAD perspective is exporting. So, as I mentioned, the exporting exporting is pretty pretty hard when you have two completely separate systems. So, in fact, it is the challenge on few levels. First level of the challenge is going through the um, uh, going through the process, uh, going through processes, human processes. So we are all human. We are all agreeing on some terms and breaking the boundary of the system that was thought to be closed is pretty hard to do in organization. And in fact, the bigger the organization is, the harder it gets because the processes must be set up in a more strict way in order to ensure no one's breaking them. So setting up whole environment for the exporting was, was kind of the challenge. But uh, it is one of the key points, I would say, for the presentation. There is no problem that is that cannot be solved. We can solve all the problems with appropriate amount of the time and business justification, in fact. Because uh, if there is a problem and we have the business justification to fight with this problem, if we can prove that client would be end client would be better if we would introduce such uh, any, uh, solutions that we would like to introduce. And we cannot because the technology doesn't allow it. The technology isn't there yet. We can make the technology there. And it is it is quite quite important thing that uh, was moving us forward in the, in building such solution. Um, let us talk for a while uh, about the technology stack here. Uh, we are using fairly common technology stack for working with Hadoop. So um, we have some Python, obviously, as um, obviously, it is not that obvious. Um, but um, as I've mentioned before, one of the core um, requirements that we got gathered from um, from our client was the seamless integration of the exploration work into the uh, into the final product we decided that python is the best way to achieve that because most of the data scientists would use python anyway we have some people that are using julia uh, that 
would like to use Julia. We have some people who'd like to use R, but Python is still vast majority of uh, in in data science world. Um, we we can consider also one of the technologies we've been considering was Scala, uh, but we've seen that if we want easily to put the work that data science achieved in the in their exploration to production, it is way simpler both for us and for them to integrate to the solution in single single language instead of introducing a little yet another level of abstraction built on the language. The Scala decision would be motivated mostly by the fact that we are using Spark, which was written in Scala and requires some uh, some understanding, to say the least, of how JVM is working, because it is it is quite important. It is not simple Python library. It is running the running JVM underneath, and without this knowledge, it, it is pretty hard to use Spark. First of all, it is hard to hard to use Spark easily, but second thing, it is hard to um, optimize Spark. So it is it is uh, it was uh, it is why we've been a little bit thinking about Scala for a while, but we we decided it is not the it's a, it it is a way worse decision than going with Python in this in, as as for now. In, the data science team is uh, loves to use their panda. Um, most of you, I guess, it is like talking for a moment about that. But I, I believe that most of you are already well aware of what Panda is and how to how to use it, uh, and why it is great library. What was a little bit interesting here is that Spark, as for one year ago, wasn't compatible with Panda, and uh, we still. Uh, and uh, Cloudera, which is owner, own, uh, which has the stewardship over Spark right now, uh, introduced a way for communicating for unification of the API between the Spark and Panda, and it is it is pretty important. So uh, we are observing that, and it it is very nice because the data science could be using exactly same tools. As they are using in both for exploration and for the Spark, we even without our help. Um, you can also recognize the TensorFlow as the as the one of our building blocks. Uh, TensorFlow is nice. It is not the nicest framework from the perspective of the code clean cleaners, I'd say. It is not the cleanest framework, um, but it is uh, it is strongly, I am strongly opinion biased, sorry for that. But uh, the thing that uh, TensorFlow has is stability and strong as, uh, and very strong, um, to call it, um, stuck to host it efficiently. So this this is main reason we are we went into in TensorFlow uh, stack. It is quite it is way simpler to productionize uh, TensorFlow than uh, than uh, than it was when we started working on this project with uh, for example PyTorch. But we are still looking in this direction. Uh, yet another uh, standard tool is Conda. I won't be describing that. Uh, from the Hadoop perspective, however, we have three major tools. We have uh, Hadoop itself as a way of storing files over uh, the distributed manner. We have Hive as the SQL layer to, to uh, store those files. We have Uzi as the um, way to coordinate on Hadoop, uh, to, to orchestrate, in fact, our workflows. Uh, and as I've as I've shown you, we have five types of workflows. Imagine that you have five types of five ty five of each workflows in of all of those groups. It is already twenty five, and we have way more. So the good orchestrator is pretty pretty important tool for us to control the flow. However, Uzi is. 
a solution that uh, is a bit old, I would say. It is not reflecting how um, uh, how we would like to our workloads to be looking. And we are looking with hope and we are looking uh, quite intensively, I would say. We are investigating and we are in trial phase to uh, on Apache Airflow. Uh, first of all, it is uh, the, the Apache Airflow workflows are written in Python, which removes one element from our stack. Second thing, it is programming. They are de defined in programming language, which allow us to do, and in fact, programmatic ways with our APIs, with, with its APIs. So we can compose, we can write, write the code around it. For now, we've, we've been achieving that with writing the code around, uh, around Uzi, writing the tooling for Uzi. However, it is always better to look for the best, for, for the best tool at the, at the moment. And we are looking at that. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, one here, uh, one, one thing. This stack I presented has two ways of building, building software with. We can build either very, very small applications or larger applications. You know, larger one, sing, single or larger application supporting multiple workflows. Um, as a first decision, we, we, one of the decisions we've taken was building building bigger application. I would mention why it was uh, we've chosen the bigger application uh, here instead of set of micro applications. But as usually, when you take such decisions, you are you must understand and you must consider what is what are the. Uh, Mm, what are possible disadvantages of going with such a way? So scaling a whole Python, Pythonic world to the huge projects wasn't this isn't the simplest task, especially understanding uh, the dynamic nature of the language and the how many tricks can be used there to not necessarily build the software that is hard to maintain after after, for example, a year or two years. So long running projects may be hard to, will be hard to maintain if you want to introduce some set of the good practices. So one of the things we wanted and we uh, actually introduced was typing. It is pretty, on one hand it is standard because multiple people are using Python with types as for now. On the second hand, you have multiple people who, are, who would say, that it is completely against the nature of the language. And from our perspective, every, every type of notation is, could be treated as unit test under, uh, under the hood. Because if you won't put those annotations, you would need, if you would like to test your application properly, you would need to check what, uh, what is the argument that is, that is passed to that. And, um, it helps in finding bugs, in fact. It is first most important thing that we introduce typing for. But second thing is the documentation. You could use the doc string, but type annotation seems easier to understand what is, uh, what is really used as the argument. And what is also important, if you use the type checker, the type annotation cannot lie and there is a small star, usually cannot lie. Um, important thing here is uh, if, you, if you are not using time annotations or you are scared of type annotations, which is also understandable, especially if you have some code and you wouldn't like to um, rewrite whole code because type annotations are cool, you can consider adding type annotations slowly. You can enrich your code with type annotations uh, in most critical parts to ensure to add those hidden unit tests that are run uh, by one of multiple type checkers. You can also switch more and or less restrictive types for type checking. For example, to give pretty good example, in fact, you may be not aware, but there is an optional 
type implemented in Python. So if you would enter, if you would use optional type annotation, you you can uh, ensure there is no none inside of your application. Um, it is pretty rest restrictive and uh, it makes development strange, especially if you're used to passing nouns uh, in some places. But uh, if you are at the stage where you consider switching in off and on or off, you, you can be assured that nullability is not your concern, in fact, because you can, you can go, with, go with that and you are considering that actively which is, in my opinion, a pretty good uh, method to understand better where, how are you standing with your code. You're not scared to introduce restrictive plugs. Um, also, uh, here I need to mention, I cannot, I cannot avoid that, uh, even though it is not my favorite topic uh, personally, but always, as I mentioned, it is the unit test. And if you are running unit tests, you can easily introduce uh, uh, continuous integration software. And if you can use continuous integration software, you can easily integrate your type checker inside. Um, here we are going to the discussion I uh, hinted to a slide ago. So, Mm, huge project or big projects versus sm very small projects. If we would live in the in the world of micro microservices, we would go with the smaller projects. However, distributing and maintaining both code and environments over hundreds of nodes in cluster is not a simple task. The automation is a key here, but even with automation, there are some dangers that uh, can appear uh, with uh, some misconfiguration of single node that was done by uh, by a mistake, by a lack or lack of the uh, uh, by the lack of the expertise, or by uh, um, by some misconception is very dangerous. Uh, also, if new, new nodes would be added and there we would have two different architectures uh, for, for us for some time, it is also dangerous. So auto, completely automated and uh, completely automated uh, distribution is first step. But second step is also completely automated checking the health of the, uh, of the environment. Um, also, the sharing solutions in organization is not easy because um, if you have the organization, even, even if it is 20 to 20 people it, uh, and you have, for example, four or five different projects working on different core, core, core roles, they, they would be different significantly. So, um, they would use different dependencies, different versions of their, their, uh, their dependencies. And if you would think about extracting some codes, uh, code, sharing some solutions, you can find yourself in a place that the only viable user for such, a, so, such solution is you. So you extracted the code for the sake of the extraction. And it is not good feeling to be in such place. And, however, is it to, to lead to the, a little bit more optimistic view on that, we still see some commonalities. So, there, are, there is some way to work between bigger projects and extract the commonalities. Um, we we found out three major ways of sharing uh, sh sharing the code. Um, extracting uh, commonalities to library was like first idea because it is obvious idea. Most of the code that is shared is usually the libraries. We are installing libraries. We are living with libraries. We are contributing to libraries, 
and we are we are uh, understanding what is the life cycle of library. However, the cost of creating library and cost of adopting the library, given what I've said before, so given the distribution and uh, maintenance uh, aspect, was too big for us. To, 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 to say the least, we started with this approach. However, we found out ourselves in such a situation where we couldn't easily share our solutions because our projects were, were way too different. Um, we have completely different like page we would be using mono repository. So if you're not aware what monorepo is, is the, you put all the projects that organization is uh, working with and uh, you put it in single Git repository. Uh, huge companies do that. Google, Google do that. And I think multiple others do it as well. I believe, uh, for example, Facebook is working with monorepo at least partially as well. Um, so what could go wrong? It's a very simple thing could go wrong. If you do not have the tooling, so if you are not invested enough uh, or your client hasn't invested enough in tooling for monorepo, um, monorepo management, it is not nice to work with monorepo because you must consider how to, how to build a part of the subtree, for example, check out part of the subtree, how to split the release processes. And from the technical point of view, as I've mentioned before, everything is easy to solve if you see the, the business value in that. So we could build that. However, the second side of the coin is this uh, aforementioned business value. Sometimes, we don't want to share the code in a way that everyone can edit our code. Sometimes we want the sense of the security. And it is why, from the political point of view, however ugly this word is, uh, we cannot use the, you know, we, we couldn't easily use the monorepo in every single scenario. So one of the ways that are common ground was using uh, Git sub modules. So, to put a little bit of the context here, Git some module is completely separate repository as common code on my slide that is included in two different products. What is pretty important is that it is full, full repository. So you can get to the common code repository inside of project two and check out master. You can get to the project one and check out master up to, uh, uh, to two, two commits older than master. And you still have the same, same, uh, same repository as its core. It is pretty nice because we have two projects. They're relying on the same core idea. However, do they have full control when they are switching to the new common things that you, uh, you extracted from one project to another. Um, and this one is game changer for us. We find, found out that many of our solutions in the organization could can be shared, but everyone was scared to extract the library directly because nobody would use it. And uh, now we can see that organization, the organization beat a bit more because people would like to share the solutions. People are feeling value in sharing the solutions. Yet another common idea that we, we are considering is the data sources. Uh, it is pretty simple, a pretty simple thing. Uh, there's a, there would be even a bit of code in this presentation in a second. Um, so what, we do, what do we expect from data source? We expect data schema filtering and validation. Uh, we have a pretty, a pretty good example from, uh, uh, from in fact, our application uh, that uh, from, from the recommendations directly. So if features are generated every single day, as you could see, as you can see on the image, but we had, we had failed, let us say that 6th of the May was the weekend, 
We had the we had the fail on Saturday. It doesn't matter at all because we can take four days in this time period and ignore this one. And such implementation, such uh, taking data with holes, was the is also pretty important for us. And it is one of the things, one of the parts of the logic for the filtering and validation. And this filtering and validation can be as intricate as you would like. And but as long as you split it from the, as long as you allow yourself to think in higher abstractions over data, it makes life simpler. Let us discuss a bit of data sources from the code perspective. We wanted it to be completely declarative. So um, you, on the right, you have the full, full feature store source, um, which is a descendant from feature store data source. Um, and we have the schema, uh, which is declared. So it is nice because during during the getting the data, we can just check check the schema uh, almost dynamically, and it is whole data source. Nothing more is required. So all the logic can be written inside of the base classes, and the end user for such data source just declares six lines. Okay, I'm done. I can use this, and I can use all the goodies that goes with this uh, with this feature store. So I, I have I am assured that filtering is okay. I am assured that uh, uh, I get the, as much data as I would like to get, um, given proper configuration. Um, yeah. Just Thank note you. that the, the time mm -hmm. is close to finish. It actually finishes, so I think we we need to conclude soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Zbigniew. I would uh, speed up a bit and skip some, some things. Um, okay. Um, important thing here is that uh, understanding the stability. It is, it is the thing I would I would like to talk about a second for a, for a moment. Uh, reducing amount of the manual actions is important and. Not only that is important, important, the second important aspect here is sharing the stability. Um, for us, pretty important aspect was uh, extracting common CI components using Jenkins shared library. We are using Jenkins for our client, our client is using Jenkins. We are pretty, um, uh, pretty good with Jenkins at the moment. So it is, it is the thing that, uh, um, it is the thing that we, we decided to do. Thanks to extracting to Jenkins shared to library, we, we have two important uh, bonuses, in fact. It is advantages. Uh, we have unit tests for your CI, which sounds ridiculous, but it brings a lot of value, especially if your workflows are pretty complex. Second thing is that you can share whole pipelines across projects. And if you share pipelines, you share common problems. And if you share common problems, you have whole team responsible for resolving such problems and you resolve problem once instead of resolving them n times uh, where n is number of your teams. With uh, cluster, we are going in, um, in, three, uh, in three directions. First of all, as I've mentioned, Airflow seems a reasonable alternative to older Uzi. Uzi. We want to train, a hybrid, uh, to train models on the cloud which is also very important uh, if your cluster do not have the, the GPUs. And third aspect is that training the models is not very simple with Spark. And there is a solution called Dusk. It is the framework that is, in fact, Panda, but uh, on, uh, on for clusters, in fact, which is pretty reasonable alternative because it, uh, it supports many uh, machine learning libraries out of the box. However, we would never say no to Spark because Catalyst, so Spark SQL engine is very strong. And it is very, very good tool uh, for, uh, it's a very good tool uh, for each set of the, uh, of the users. Uh, going uh, quickly <laughs> as, uh, as, I, as my time is going, um, I need to speed up for the, for the serving parts, which is also pretty interesting, but, uh, 
the most important aspect here was that we have the overhead we needed to minimize the overhead for the serving so uh, the, there's a rule that if client is waiting more than uh, zero point two seconds to load the page he would not like to load this page at all so if our model would be served in such time it is not a good solution it, it, so we needed to minimize, minimize that uh, additionally everything needed to be automated so okay i talked about this a bit so to put the the, the tech stack here and how we resolved that we had the core uh, we had the core that is mathem mathematic intensive because on the serving side we needed to serve the map and it is not especially for the teams and we call, collaborated with teams that were using java before it was very hard for them to understand how how to deal with that so we decided that after all that using python on serving side is also a good solution as long as we are considering the numerical operations then we use the aio http as the async server uh, which were scaled with uh, G unicorn to have them multiple workers and then we scaled it even up uh, higher up with kubernetes hosted on, on aws uh, from the perspective of the serving model itself i also uh, talked about, uh, a bit about that we use tensorflow serving uh, um, it's a very simple. We have the model repo in the repository. We are predicting using gRPC and we are uh, scaling the, Q, the whole serving with Kubernetes as well. Uh, this gRPC is seriously cool. We, we compared with the HTTP and the, the, there was significant difference uh, about twice a throughput, I believe. I would need to comp uh, comp compare the numbers. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Hubert, I think uh, we should not let uh, Dan and the audience wait too much. Uh, suggestion is uh, perhaps let's uh, finish really briefly and maybe if you're able to share the slides, I'm, I'm not sure if you're technically able to do that, but if you're able to share the slides in the chat, then uh, we, you know, uh, everybody could catch up on what's remaining and then mm -hmm. uh, we can talk during the Q&A session. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, and absolutely. So, so let's, and and then let's mm -hmm. let's have it done, okay? Mm, absolutely, yes. Um, mm, I agree. Uh, so um, let's get to the uh, to the end here. Um, few notes, for, like ending ending thoughts for that. Looking at all what I discussed, the th we delivered the uh, the recommendations from data to the, the to product quickly because we had the vision and we agreed on the ownership. We, all of us owned the product and also we divided the responsibilities, the data science, the ML engineers, the software engineers supporting the, the, um, uh, the serving part. These three were, uh, was pretty important. And in, high, in this hybrid environment where you have the experts on both sides, you need to learn you need to, because you won't find the team that can build from the thousands of the gigabytes of data and then the same team builds uh, high throughput uh, ultra fast web service on uh, on cloud however without this cross skills it is impossible and the third thing that is pretty important is that automation is the key for multiple things and if you have the automation if you can automate the agreement, you can easily connect these two words together because it is, it is, they are not that far. They are not the same. They are not that far. So we can, we can easily uh, connect them, uh, connect them to, uh, connect them together with, with good, uh, good agreement. So to, without further ado, it's all from me. Sorry for being here for uh, have, uh, enlarging my presentation, and I'm very happy to I could provide this presentation to, to you. So see you on Q&A session. Thank you.